two of them. What is he giving her and what is she receiving? In her bottom right corner, we see some small birds in a nest that he appears to be giving her and she appears to be receiving. What are the birds a representation of? <coughs> Fertility, youthfulness, energy, sexuality. This is a suggestive, sexually suggestive image. 16th century style, 17th century style. How <coughs> radical would it have been to have such an image? Him smiling happily at her and her coyly receiving what he is giving her. Why is it that this image was painted in the 17th century in Bristol? As a warning, we might receive that in 21st century style, or as a representation of what was taking place. What if I said to you that these two may be brother and sister? Does that help you in your thinking? So, recapping now, um, because we uh, want to have time for questions. We should conceptualize or reconceptualize the way in which we see English history. Um, hitherto, the way in which English history is portrayed is often portrayed in a very linear fashion. I understand why. People have targets, don't you know? They have ref criteria, don't you know? And those criteria and those ref requirements tend to mean that you have to get through a module. You have to get through a program. You have to get through a degree. And then you have to start working. That's the idea. So where's research and all that? Where's groundbreaking research? Where's the research that's actually going to change the way in which we see things? Who's doing that? Let's hope that some universities are, but not many are. Because there may not be money involved in it. It certainly wasn't when I started. There isn't much now. So when I talk about some of those things, just to get you started, in your thinking. The question obviously would be, why haven't I heard of these things before? Why is it that I only hear about Othello and images of darkness, images of the other, images of the stranger in English society, and never about all these real people of African descent that lived in English society? So a good way to conceptualize this is a way in which Englishmen and people in England have seen English history. So Venerable Bede in the 7th century CE wrote that the original inhabitants of Britannia, whether indigenous or foreign, are like most other countries unknown. When the Venerable Bede says that, he is saying that he is not part of the original people. Richard Cyrus Sester in the 14th century says the original inhabitants of these isles, whether indigenous or foreign, are like most other countries unknown. He's saying that he's not part of that original population. Francis Bacon in the 17th century says something similar. The original inhabitants of these islands are indigenous and white, like most other countries unknown. All of these people, these Englishmen, are saying that they are not the indigenous people. And yet when we look at English society, we look almost as if whiteness is a pass for indigenousness. And that by being white, we automatically are indigenous. When in fact, being white is just a reflection of a topography, or an imagery, or a way in which we have been manifested. And it doesn't preclude or justify any form of us being indigenous or not. Because these people who were white said that their ancestry wasn't the original ancestry, and they don't know who the original people of these islands were. So, really, um, what we um, can do today, as I said, in 50 minutes, it's not possible. It's not possible in 50 minutes to give an exposition of everything that is missing from the history books that you may read. It's not possible in 50 minutes to do that. All I can do is present some images, some ideas, for, to make you look at things differently from the way in which you looked at them before. There will probably be, and I hope to God there are, more questions that you have, I expect, and I'm hoping, 
that you have thousands of questions, whether or not you're going to ask them, whether you've got the time or not to ask them at this point. I don't know. But you should have thousands of questions, because if I was you, I would have thousands of questions. I would want to know why the information that we've just been talking about is so new to you. Why is it that when they talk about diversity in early modern England, they don't start with actual people of African descent, but they give you Othello, as if Pulp Fiction was an accurate representation of 20th century America. If you wanted to find a documentary on America in the 20th century, you don't switch on Pulp Fiction, do you? Well, I hope you don't, because Pulp Fiction is fantasy. It's fiction. It's not a documentary. If you want to find out about 20th century America, you have to watch a documentary or read about 20th century America. In the same way, to understand about early modern England, you've got to read about early modern England. You've got to read what people at the time actually wrote and said, not just what Ben Johnson fictionalised, or Christopher Marlowe happened to imagine, or what William Shakespeare happened to describe. So, the call is upon you. Most of you will form part of a new generation. That's a big responsibility, post-Brexit and everything else. You have a huge responsibility about how this country sees itself. The identity in which this country takes on is a massive responsibility because most people in this country don't have an accurate representation of their own identity. Their identity has been shaped by a fiction which bears no reality to history. History is far more diverse than has hitherto ever perhaps been explained to you. And it has been collections of people throughout the world that have helped shape the human condition, helped shape European condition, and helped shape this country. So, um, we leave that now for questions, and encourage you now to take on the new role as I pass the baton from me to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for a very thought-provoking lecture. Um, I encourage them to study more and deeper into our own history. Okay, now we have time for some questions, please. Um, raise your hands and pose your question. Over there, and then over there. Okay, you go first, please. Uh, I'm, I'm curious about the potential impact of the swing towards Protestantism. Now, I noticed a lot of the iconography you showed has came from things like roof screens which would have stopped being displayed, even the myth about Thomas a Becket, and during the um, mid-16th century rebellions, the myth of Thomas a Becket as a whole, the whole saint cult was suppressed. And I wonder if, to some extent, the Protestant Reformation suppressed the black iconography and religious art. Very good question. Um, have you heard of a writer called Walter Thomas Rogers? Uh, no. Okay, Walter Thomas Rogers is a, a very important um, Protestant writer. Protestant nationalist, if you like even more so than, than, than John Fox um, in Scotland um, uh, and other, other people. Um, and so, Walter Thomas Rogers writes a book about the, um, the end of the world and the second coming of Christ. Uh, this book is a polemic um, called The End of the World and the Second Coming of Christ. Of course, in the 15th and 16th century, there were many Protestant hegemonists who believed that the world was coming to an end by the 1600s, and it would be brought about by a Catholic uprising or by the absurdness of paganism or something else. Ironically, many of these Protestants took on the symbol of black as a representation of their divineness. Hitherto, that idea of them taking on this blackness was seen purely as a symbolic representation. That's why they wear the black attire, to show that they are without sin, they are not gaudy, that this black that they are attired from in head to toe it shows that they are clean, that they are pure. It's purely symbolic. And that this blackness had nothing to do with the sable and blackness of an ethnicity or a colour of skin. But if you read further, Francis Bacon, if you read further uh, the actual Protestants of their time, you will see often that they refer not only to the blackness of the attire, but the blackness of skin colour being spotless and without sin. With a belief that the black is a representation of the true church in a way in which the gaudy colours of Catholicism 
and whiteness cannot be a representation of the true church. This is a part of Protestant iconography that has hitherto been unexplored and needs to be. But it is there. If you read these authors from cover to cover, which is a very laborsome process, which most people do not. They just go for the juicy bits. You know, the anti-Catholic rants, the rants against women, the rants against um, witches, those types of things are the things that we go for. Um, but if you read it from cover to cover, you will see that they make the representation not only to the blackness in the attire, but blackness in skin color. And an idea that the spotless hue of the African is a symbol of divinity in a way in which the white, gaudy colors of Catholicism are not. Yeah. Is that the answer to your question? Yeah. There's a lot more. There's a lot more, yes. So it continues, in fact. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, back. Um, I was just intrigued to know how you feel and what you think um, on, on our sexual orientation and sexual orientation. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> history, um, the young lady asked a question about what do we think about our perceptions of Britain in the past. Is, is that correct? Yeah. Unfortunately, history has become politicized in the sense that when I was young, um, older than, uh, than I perhaps I may look, I learned um, from a book called 1066 and all that. It was a book, yeah? It was a small A5 book that had um, a picture of William the Conqueror on it, drawn quite badly. And it talked about kings and queens and what have you, dates and what have you. I was told everything I need to know about English history is in 1066 and all that, this book. Now, not everything I need to know was in that book, but the book was all of men. There was no women in the book, except for some of the queens. Queen Elizabeth was in the book. There was a few women, but mostly men. They were all white and they were all mostly Christian. So I grew up thinking that that was a history of England. It was about kings and queens who were mostly white and who killed people. So, if I don't fit into that category, and I happen not to, I'm a man, but I don't fit in in any other way into that category, where do I fit in? If I'm a woman, how do I fit in to the history of this country? If I'm a Muslim or a Sikh or a Hindu, how do I fit into the history of this country? If I'm working class, I'm not, a, I'm not from noble blood, how do I fit into the history of this country? Well, traditionally, you didn't. That was the point. Traditionally, the history of this country was devoid of any of those stories. Almost as if your existence was an afterthought of the modern era. And before the modern era, you didn't exist. But if you read history correctly, you find that these people that have been excluded from history were in fact part of history. It's just that the people that were writing the history of this country had a particular mission in what they wrote. Sometimes their mission was political. Sometimes their mission was jingoistic. Sometimes it was religious or cultural. Or just sometimes it was because somebody paid them who was no well wealthy, noble, and rich, and they paid them to write their history. And because the person that paid them was from a certain class, it represented that class. That's what happened. So, all of this means that sometimes when we look at the past and what is written about it, um, we don't get a full picture. What makes it worse is that then in the 19th century, when England became Britain, Britain then became the most powerful empire in the world. And it then needed to see itself differently. The ambiguities of its historical past needed to be erased. Britain had to be conceptualized as a nation that had always been Christian. In some cases, in some ways, had always been white. That's the message that was sent. That's the message that was sent to ordinary people, and that's the message that was sent around the world, of ethnic continuity and um, ethnic persistency in this country not actually based up by the reality of ethnic diversity, political inconsistency, religious diversity. So the history of this country is different from often what the political writers write. However, luckily for us, some people 
in English history wrote at the time what was actually happening at the time. And when we read them, we read about what they write about ordinary people, we can find out about the diversity of this country. So when we examine some of those writers from the time, and we can be bothered to read them from, from page to page, we find out that in fact England was remarkably more diverse than has hitherto um, been stated. But it requires research of primary records. Primary records meaning those records written at the time. And often it means actually looking at the primary record in its original format in Latin or Norman French or Old English and about reading those original texts in those original languages. And that's how we find out about what actually happened in the past. Take one more. Okay. Um, can you say a few words to us about ideas of ethnicity mm. in the early period and how they apply to England? Good. Um, if you can conclude with that question. Yes, yes. Thank you. So that, that's a very, very, very important um, question. The, um, what you may study is the science of race. The science of race is a pseudoscience mostly conceptualized in the 18th and 19th century. Although some people will say that of course there were ideas about race that have been with humanity from the beginning of time. Ethnicity tends to be the terminology that most modern historians use to describe something that we would, in the past, have called race. Ethnicity being a collection of those ideas that make us human. It can be religion, can be colour, can be culture, can be language. All of those things and more can make up ethnicity. So, the perception has been that Europe, England, prior even to 1948, was a mono-ethnic country. In other words, that the people that lived in England were exclusively, if not predominantly, white and Christian. And that there were no other people present here, or if they were here, they were marginal, transient, etc. The study of ethnicity is to question that idea to question that notion, to question the idea of a mono-ethnic society, to question the idea of whether people or how people saw difference. Were people, in fact, more embracing of those people who fell within their community and family? Did they see them as part of their own ethnicity, no matter what color they were? For example, Anne Vass, who got married to Anthony Vass in 1618, in St. Bortolph without Aldgate in London, was part of her community. Like Mary Phyllis was part of her community. No matter that, they were actually of African descent. As members of their community, were they considered as part of the same ethnicity as that community, though there was a reference to their ethnicity? How other were they? I suggest, in fact, that they weren't very other at all, even though their ethnicity is stated, because they were part of a community. They got married, they got baptised in a community. In order to get baptised and married in a community church, you had to be a member of that church. If you were not a member of that church, it was very difficult for you to become baptised as a member of that church. So, certainly for St. Bortolph without Allgate, where these three people lived, that community saw its ethnicity at least as being inclusive enough to include these people of African descent. And perhaps these people of African descent may have been considered more part of their own local ethnicity than somebody else who may be white, may be Christian, that came from another parish, let alone from another country. So this is a different way of looking at ethnicity a different way of looking at strangeness and otherness, a different way of looking at English identity. And it's a suggestion to you that the notion of English identity that has been given to you is probably a false notion. People were mostly local people who lived in local communities. And 
who accepted each other on a local basis. And if you became part of that local community, you were part of that local family. The idea of a national identity was distant, present perhaps, but distant, and doesn't become a focal point for English identity, I don't think, until the 18th century, perhaps slightly before, perhaps somewhat before, because of imperialism. It's only at the point of imperialism and colonialism and England's success, inverted commas, and imperialism and colonialism, and the establishment of a British empire, does the need to define English ethnicity within narrow lines um, come about? Yeah. There is much more that can be said on that. Yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed. Let's give another round of applause. Thank you. Yeah. thank you all for coming. And before you leave, please come and have a look at the book. And those of you interested, you might buy it as well. It's here, and your will sign the copy yes. for you. So. You've got his handwriting in for the memory and the posterity. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.